I bring you greetings from the Living Church Foundation, which has been meeting this week in your fair city. It's my privilege to serve as the editor of the Living Church magazine, and I'm very grateful for your support and prayer and for your financial generosity to our ministry. I also thank Dean Price for the invitation of preaching in your beautiful cathedral at what sounds like a very exciting time in your common life. You will be in my prayers during all the adventures that lie ahead for you. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All the recent chatter about international travel beginning again brought back a memory for me this week from a few years ago. I met up for coffee with one of my parishioners, a college student, to give him some travel advice. Eric was going to study literature for a term at King's College in London, and he wanted a few pointers about museums, historical sites, and churches. And he also asked me for some guidance about the two or three weeks after his term finished, when he was hoping to get around the rest of Europe. Now there was a big list of places that Eric was dying to see. There's Paris, of course, and the Rhine Valley in Germany, and wouldn't it be wonderful to climb the Alps? And he had a friend studying for a term in Montpellier down on the Mediterranean coast. And as he went through this great list of places he wanted to see, I was trying to slow him down a little bit. You don't want to spend half your time on trains, after all, and you might be able to go back again later in life and see a few of the things you will have to miss this time, I told him. But of course, by American standards, all these places are really quite close to each other. This is part of the wonder of Europe to an American. In a few hours, you can travel between places whose languages, histories, food, music, and architecture are completely different. Now, Texas, I'm told, is entirely exceptional. <laughs> but Maryland, where I'm from, is not all that different from Minnesota. And you, and the, and the, the but Spain and Portugal, Spain and Poland are a world apart. And the distance is about the same as it is between Maryland and Minnesota. Of course, the fascination works the other way when Europeans come to America. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, who is British, taught for a time at McGill in Montreal. When his English friends came to visit him for a vacation, they would propose completely unrealistic itineraries because they're used to everything being so close together. Let's drive down to New York for the day, they would say, and, and uh, then maybe we'll go to Disney World and swing by the Grand Canyon and end up in Seattle. Wright eventually found a map of North America for his guest bedroom with a tiny inset in the corner that showed Britain on the same scale, that is, about the size of Alabama. Oh, I see, the guests would say. That puts matters into a clearer perspective. But what would it be like, Wright wondered, to have a map that worked the other way, one that showed North America on the scale of Britain? Well, you just have to keep unfolding and unfolding a map like that one. It would fill the whole room. It's almost impossible to get your mind around that much space. Isaiah walked into the temple at a troubling time in Israel's life. King Uzziah had died. He was, by the standard of Israel's rulers, a good king. His reign had been an era of stability, and the nation had prospered and remained united in peace. And it was not at all certain what was going to happen next. His son, the new king Jotham, was largely untested. Reading between the lines in Isaiah's 
prophetic message, there were mounting social and political problems. Some were advocating that Israel develop different diplomatic alliances. The wealthy may have been taking advantage of weak oversight to oppress the poor. It was an uneasy time, and the future was far from certain. And Isaiah probably wasn't the only person who went to the temple that day hoping to turn over some of his troubles to God. And what a vision he received. Isaiah sees the Lord seated on his throne of glory. He is high and lifted up, and the edge of his robe seems to fill the whole temple, which was almost certainly the largest space that Isaiah had ever seen. The seraphim, the sacred guardian angels that surround God, fly about, proclaiming that he is holy, thrice holy, set above all things as ruler and judge. Isaiah falls to his knees, undone by this sight, and confesses his sin, his unworthiness to behold such a vision. The anxieties of Israelite politics are far behind him now. It is entirely fixed on this vision. God's voice sounds out from his majestic throne, commissioning Isaiah as a prophet, a bearer of his word to his people. It would be a hard word, which was often rejected, but a sure word, for his eyes had seen the Lord. It was a moment that Isaiah surely recalled countless times in what would be a long ministry full of frustration and uncertainty. When he was discouraged when the message seemed too difficult to bear, he turned back to the Lord, seeking him in his temple. Isaiah's perspective was widened that day. From that moment on, he knew that God would be with him this thrice holy God, the king and throne over all. His eyes were open to a whole other dimension surrounding earthly life. Once he had glimpsed it, the truth of that vision remained with him forever. This Sunday, Trinity Sunday, exists for the sake of our common worship. The doctrine of the Holy Trinity is not a meaningless theological abstraction, and we do not teach and celebrate it today just to endorse the conclusions of a church council from 1600 years ago. The doctrine of the Holy Trinity defines the one whom we worship as he has revealed himself to us in sacred scripture. To confess the Trinity is to witness to God's saving work that has brought us into fellowship with him. Our God is the thrice holy one whom Isaiah saw in the, in the temple, who created all things and rules eternally. And he has sent his only son into the world to become one of us, a true man in Jesus of Nazareth. The son is not the father, but he exists eternally with him of the same substance, sharing together in the same work. And the Holy Spirit proceeds eternally from the Father and the Son. He is the one who lives within us and pours out his gifts upon us. The Spirit is not some lesser part of God, but equal in dignity and power, bringing to fulfillment the one plan of salvation. The three persons are one God, distinct yet united. And if this all seems a bit difficult to understand, that is as it should be, be wary of those cutesy metaphors people sometimes use to explain the Trinity, as the theologians tell us they usually run afoul in one respect or another. The doctrine of the Trinity testifies to God, but it does not control him. Even the writings of our most brilliant theologians can but grasp the train of his rule. We can say clearly what God is not. He is not brute force or doddering benevolence. 
He is not a capricious trickster like the ancient pagan gods, sheer oppressive will like the master of the mosque, or some abstract higher power, the creation of our own winds. God's much bigger than all that, much more majestic and profound. And to meet him, as Isaiah found long ago, is to be transformed forever. Perhaps like the prophet, you bring your own anxieties to God's house today. There's trouble with your job, someone you love is sick, you worry about the changes in the cathedral's life that are coming, or the stability of our nation when so many deep problems surround us. You don't really know how to pray about it, but you know that this is the place to come, and you need a change in perspective. May you find him today, the one who fills the temple and blazes with glory, the one thronged by seraphim, who comes as the Savior and who lives within you as the Spirit. Whatever you are facing, you can be sure that our God, the triune God, is wiser, stronger, and purer and whatever troubles you. May you see him in new ways and know without a doubt that when your life is in his hands, there is no safer place to be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.